Good morning, Dog Nation Daily. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Serve Pro. That's right. Happy to welcome Serve Pro uh, to our program as our Tuesday sponsor here now, a company you've heard us talk about before, and now an even bigger part of what's happening here at Dog Nation as our daily presenting sponsor. Uh, here today. Welcome in Serve Pro to the program. We also welcome you in there as well. We think we've got a really fun show for you. Georgia projected to finish at the very top of the SEC for the upcoming season. We'll tell you what the, all that means here coming up in a moment and why an SEC championship this season might be sweeter than any time in the past. We'll do that here coming up. And as the old saying sort of goes, or at least a thing I've said plenty of times in the past, if you're making your rivals, if you're making your competition mad, that means in a roundabout way, you're probably doing something right. We'll tell you off the top of the program today exactly why Kirby Smart's making at least one SEC coach pretty angry here right now. All of that is on the way. So we're glad to have you with us for it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It is so much fun to say. It's presented today by Serve Pro, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Serve Pro. Cleaning, restoration, construction. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. You know, if there hadn't been so much going on yesterday, NFL scouting combine, things like that, we probably would have started our week by discussing the topic we're going to start with here today. Because I just think it's fun. I don't think this is the kind of thing that anybody ought to get all that upset about. But I do think it's pretty entertaining, and I think it's the kind of thing that you want, I believe, the SEC to sort of be about. And that is the fact that one SEC coach apparently is very upset with Kirby Smart here right now, at least based on this coach's own words. This goes back to Friday, right at the end of the week, too late on in the day for us to have as a part of Friday's show, kind of simmering over the weekend. We'd sort of planned on discussing this on Monday, as I said before, but just didn't quite have time to get that done. So without further ado... I want to dive into the topic here right now. You know that one of the issues that's happened uh, thus far this offseason is the fact that when Brian McClendon, Georgia's wide receivers coach, left to go take the same job at the Tampa Bay Bucks, that left an opening for Georgia. We kind of debated and discussed who might eventually fill that role. Eventually, it was determined that James Coley, who had been here in the past and who had been recently hired by South Carolina to be its wide receivers coach, was going to leave the Gamecocks, was going to come here to UGA instead. Now, the Coley arrival here ever after having been offensive coordinator in 2019 generated plenty of discussion, but there's a different kind of discussion taking place in Columbia, South Carolina, where Beamer was supposed to be, or should say where Coley was supposed to be and was supposed to work. And on, I guess it was Friday, I'm sure around you know spring practice, uh, Shane Beamer doing a press conference made it very clear that he wasn't very happy. Actually, the press conference had been to introduce the new wide receivers coach. Let me correct myself on that. But Beamer, in the midst of this discussion, made it clear that he wasn't happy about having to be here and having this discussion again and probably wasn't too happy with James Coley for leaving uh, and for, uh, 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 you know, uh, for, you know, Kirby Smart for doing what he did. Apparently, we don't have this. So let me instead uh, just kind of describe to you a little bit about what was said about that. Shane Beamer, uh, you know, talking about the fact that uh, he got the buyout, you know, was, you know, had, had that kind of paid to him and uh, 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 you know, you know, ultimately just, you know, a little bit frustrated. The fact that he's there having to do that again, essentially making it sound like, you know, obviously that, you know, James Coley was not the wide receivers coach they wanted to have to begin with, that instead it was a different, uh, you know, wide receivers coach they ultimately had to hire. But Shane Beamer says, well, this is a better wide receivers coach anyway. We'll, uh, you know, ma- ma- make sure. I think you go to dognation.com. You can see the clip that everybody's been kind of talking about there on this. Apologize for not having that uh, here for you right now. But, you know, that is, is something that's obviously out there. And I think for a lot of Georgia fans, you're sort of left to wonder about, you know, you know, what the reaction this is supposed to be. Look at Shane Beamer. He's so upset. He's so angry. And, you know, what does this mean about James Coley, you know, after having briefly been employed in in Columbia, there at South Carolina, you know, coming here to UGA, you know, what's going on with all that? What is all of that about? And, you know, what what I'll tell you here is, um, is that ultimately, I think my reaction to this is probably a little bit different than some Georgia fans because I think my overall view of Shane Beamer 
is probably a little bit different than some fans probably is. I think a lot of people rightly rightly perceive there's a little bit of uh, a rivalry between Kirby Smart and Shane Beamer, and so that sort of colors the way they feel about Shane Beamer. We do have the clip we can play for you now. Just, so, just to make sure we sort of set this up the right way, let me let you hear the thing we were discussing, which is the idea that on the event of having to introduce a brand new wide receivers coach, Shane Beamer was more than happy to sort of express some frustration with the fact that here he is doing all of this again after James Coley decided to leave. This was Shane Beamer from Friday. I didn't think we'd be here again introducing a wide receivers coach, but uh, it is what it is. The previous receivers coach made a decision that he felt was best for his family. All right, maybe we don't have all... All right, so something's not quite right with that clip there. So we're not going to be able to do that for you here right now. But you got a little bit of the taste of that. Uh, you know, hey, this guy made the decision. Talking about James Coley made the decision to do what was right for his family. Uh, and then we got the $450,000 buyout and blah, 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 blah. Basically say that's not the guy we wanted anyway. The new guy we're hiring that no one's ever heard of. This is the guy that we really want, not this other guy there instead. And as I was kind of saying before, I think a lot of you kind of view this, and I would understand why this is the case. You sort of view this through the lens of, well, it seems like over the course of years, Kirby Smart and Shane Beamer have a pretty healthy rivalry with each other. We're sort of led to believe some of this may stem from when Beamer worked here at UGA, going back to Kirby Smart's first staff in 2016. You know, there has been, you know, some of the, you know, annex Kirby Smart on the sideline, very aggressively pointing first down, for instance, you know, uh, in the 2022 game, you know, certainly – you know, pretty happy to, to you know, to, to see a, a, a pretty big win there from a final margin of victory standpoint for Georgia against South Carolina. There's been a lot of circumstantial evidence over the years that would suggest, hey, maybe uh, Kirby Smart doesn't like Shane Beamer very much, and maybe Shane Beamer doesn't like Kirby Smart very much. There's been some of that that's out there. A lot of the Georgia fans have the perspective of, well, if my guy Kirby Smart doesn't like Shane Beamer, well, then I don't like Shane Beamer either. And I sort of understand where that kind of comes from from a fan standpoint. I guess I'm probably overall not as anti Shane Beamer as, you know, some other folks are because there is at least from the perspective of this clip where at least he's being honest, you know, at, at least he's sort of coming from an honest place here. And I think it's important to note in the rough and tumble, intensely competitive world of the SEC, not everybody has to be friends and not everybody has to like each other all the time. And if Georgia, in the event of needing a wide receivers coach, comes and steals a wide receivers coach that you just hired, causing you some personal embarrassment, even if they were willing to pay the buyout to you to kind of get all that done, that you don't have to pretend to be okay with that. You don't have to pretend to like that. It's okay to be upset about it. In fact, it sort of parallels another story that's out there right now of Eli Drinkwitz this week explaining why last year, you remember when Missouri beats Tennessee, and when a B, a Drinkwitz went out to shake Josh Heifel's hand, he said, we stand on business, and that was like this really, really controversial thing at the time. And, you know, Drinkwitz essentially shrugged off the topic this week saying, hey, the reason why I did that was because I promised my team I would. They wanted me to if we won the game, and so therefore I did. And, you know, Drinkwitz says it doesn't have to be more serious than that, that Heifel may not have liked it. Tennessee fans may not like Drinkwitz now because of it, but, hey, this is what my players wanted me to do, so therefore – I wasn't going to worry so much about Eli, uh, uh, Josh Heupel's feelings. I was going to be a lot more intent to kind of do what my players wanted me to do, essentially saying I'm willing to be seen as a bad guy in the eyes of Tennessee if it makes me a little bit more favorable in the eyes of my own players. And not everybody would make that choice as a coach, but that's the choice that Eli Drinkwitz made. And he's sort of okay with the thought that maybe Josh Heupel doesn't like him very much or maybe people around Tennessee don't like him very much. And I would say that Shane Beamer, I'd be a little comfortable with that when it comes to Kirby Smart and Georgia there as well. And I would say that all of that is probably okay. Not everybody has to like each other. And you don't have to pretend that everything is good when it's obviously not. We said this at the time, that Georgia going into Columbia to pull out James Coley was in a very aggressive move. It's the kind of thing that probably doesn't get spoken about as much because it's just so casual the way in which Georgia did it. But the fact that Georgia can just go poach coaches from SEC, at least border rivals, if not traditional rivals, if you can go poke an S- poach an SEC coach that quickly, it sort of speaks to the to the power that Georgia has as a program, the financial resources that Georgia perhaps has a program, the fact that it's able to pay the buyout to do that. And if you're Shane Beamer, 
expressing some frustration about that. That probably makes some sense and maybe kind of a reasonable way to look at all of that. But the other place I just wanted, wanted to take this for a moment, in addition to, you know, a little bit of frustration from Shane Beamer and the fact that some Georgia fans kind of give that some attention, in addition to that, I think it also gives us a chance to sort of revisit the overall topic of, wow, if James Coley is getting this much attention for not working at South Carolina, coming back to work at Georgia again, then it's perhaps a little bit of a reminder that there's going to be a pretty big spotlight on James Coley in terms of how he handles himself as Georgia's wide receivers coach. This was already a little bit of a hot topic because people remember him as offensive coordinator. Not everybody was thrilled with that performance there at that particular time. And people also know that that Georgia has just a little bit of a, we've called it kind of a perception problem when it comes to the wide receiver position overall. So in addition to getting the extra attention because Shane Beamer has made it clear that he's not happy with the way in which James Coley left South Carolina, it's also a reminder that Coley comes to Georgia, I think facing a, a pretty big responsibility for what the Georgia wide receiver position becomes on his watch. And this is kind of a small thing, but I was looking at this the other day as sort of an example of, you know, perhaps what Georgia is or could be at wide receiver compared to what, you know, people currently think that it is and currently expect from it. And a lot of this stems from the performance of Ladd McConkey at the NFL Scouting Combine last week. We talked a lot about Amarius Mims at the Combine yesterday, but another Georgia player who really generated a lot of positive attention in Indianapolis was Ladd McConkey. And it's the kind of thing that both sort of speaks to the personal achievement of Ladd outpacing his recruiting ranking as much as probably any player ever has in terms of the kind of NFL draft, draft prospect he is compared to, you know, you know where he was sort of thought to be coming out of high school. But in addition to that, it sort of speaks of the lack of expectation that people seem to have for Georgia wide receivers and at times the ability of Georgia wide receivers to sort of confound those expectations and actually look better, perform better than people sort of think that the Georgia wide receiver is supposed to be able to do. In fact, Daniel Jeremiah is one of the most respected draft analysts of all. He works for the uh, NFL Network. He's at Move the Sticks on X. And uh, Daniel Jeremiah put out this comp the other day, which I think a lot of people thought was kind of interesting. But if you look at Ladd McConkey in this year's draft and you compare him to a guy like Garrett Wilson out of Ohio State who was taken with the number 10 overall pick in the 2022 draft, you see a lot of similarities. Uh, almost exactly the same height, almost exactly the same weight. Their 40-yard dash, and this is where McConkey really made a name for himself, was only one one-hundredth of a second slower than what Garrett Wilson's was. Uh, Lau was a 4.39. Wilson was a 4.38. Their broad jump was almost exactly the same. Uh, McConkey's one inch better. And their vertical leap was exactly the same. So what, McCon- what uh, Jeremiah is saying here, hey, is from a measurable athletic standpoint, Lad McConkey is almost precisely the same as Garrett Wilson, a guy who has taken number 10 over on the 2022 draft and has had two 1,000-yard seasons in the, NFL, in, a, in the NFL for the New York Jets. But that's not what people think that Georgia wide receivers are supposed to be. That's not what people think that Lad McConkey is supposed to be. That's not what people think the other Georgia wide receivers are supposed to be, which once again speaks to the job that, that James Coley can do and perhaps needs to do to both raise the perception of the Georgia wide receivers and make sure the receivers like McConkey, who go on to be very promising NFL draft picks, they maximize that full potential while they're playing in college there as well. And I was, you know, looking at, you know, some of the numbers, uh, kind of comparing Wilson and McConkey a little bit more. You know, Wilson's best season in college, his final year at Ohio State was 2021. He had 70 catches for 1,058 yards that particular season. Now, we sort of know when it comes to Georgia, that seems like the moon landing in terms of a statistical achievement for a wide receiver. Georgia, as has been well documented, has only had one 1,000-yard receiver in its program history. That was Terrence Edwards all the way back in 2002. By now, more than 20 years ago, a very long time, of course. But when you look at what Ladd McConkey did for Georgia in 2022, He had 58 catches for 762 yards that season. And so I think what a lot of us thought is, wow, you know, McConkey having that kind of production in 2022, coming back for 2023, who's to say that he couldn't have even had more uh, statistical achievement and couldn't have had an even bigger year statistically in 2023 than he'd had in 2022, perhaps putting him a little bit more even with what a guy like Wilson had been able to do. 
Alas, we'll never know that one way or another because obviously Ladd McConkey spent a lot of this year injured. The sort of and, and the sort of unanswered nature of that question, I think, kind of speaks to the overall narrative around the Georgia wide receivers of what really is going on here. We're led to believe that Georgia is sort of less than when it comes to receiver position. But the overall performance of Ladd McConkey would suggest that's not the case. The early days of George Pickens as an NFL receiver, that would sort of suggest that's not the case. The fact that Brock Bowers, who, you know, technically speaking, counts as a tight end, but in terms of the way that he's played, clearly transcends that position as a little bit more of just a true pass catcher. You know, that sort of, I think, speaks against the overall narrative about Georgia somehow being less than in this particular category. That There is a perception around the Georgia wide receiver position, as we've now said multiple times, that doesn't quite match the reality. But the job of James Coley as wide receivers coach is to kind of bring the reality more in line with the perception so that all doubt is removed about exactly how good Georgia can be at this position. So the overall bottom line is this. James Coley's departure from South Carolina to Georgia gets a lot of attention. Some of that negatively because South Carolina is upset about the way that he left. For Georgia, it's more about the curiosity of what can James Coley do to raise the fortunes of a position that doesn't seem to be a match for the success that Georgia has at every other position group. We're only a few days away from the start of spring practice. As we move towards that and the 2024 season, there is no doubt that James Coley's position, the wide receiver spot, is going to be very much in the spotlight here for Georgia. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are glad to have you with us and happy to welcome in a brand new sponsor to our program today. How about our friends from Serve Pro? You've heard us talk about Serve Pro on Dog Nation Daily before, but now we have them in even a bigger spot. Right here as our presenting sponsor on Tuesdays. What a thrill that is to have Serve Pro as a part of Dog Nation Daily here today. So if you're watching on video, 10 a.m., if you're listening on the radio on Athens Sports Radio 960, The Ref, if you're on podcast there as well, all of that being made possible today by our friends there at Serve Pro. Now, the cool thing about having Serve Pro in an even bigger role around Dog Nation is we can tell you firsthand exactly what they're all about. In our old studio, part of the reason why that's our old studio, now we have you know a new studio, but in our old studio, you remember one time we had a huge water leak and uh, you know total disaster on the weekend, and our friends at Serve Pro came and did all the work and got it all put together. Like we said before, they get it back for you like it never even happened. That's what Sir Pro is all about. That when damage strikes your uh, home, the cleanup and restoration specialists of Sir Pro want to take care of all of that and every step of the way, do everything that needs to be done to get you back there on your feet. The uh, way we say it is like it never even happened because you've got some sort of fire damage or water intrusion or these kinds of things that commonly cause a huge mess. You want to blink your eyes and make that go away. Large friends at Sir Pro, the restoration specialist there, can do kind of the next best thing for you there on that. Also, each and every Sir Pro franchise is independently owned and operated. And I really like that. What that means is that when you reach out and call our friends at Sir Pro, you're kind of reaching out because you have a major is- issue that you have a vested interest in seeing uh, a positive resolution for, whether that's the home you live in or the commercial property that you depend on for your income or perhaps passive income, rental property, things like that. When you're picking up that phone, you've got a big outcome in mind. Well, guess what? The independently owned and operated franchise on the other side of that, our friends at ServPro, they've got the same vested interest in that outcome. So when you do business with ServPro, you're doing business with people who want you to be positively impacted by that entire experience. So please make sure you check them out online. It's servepro.com. It's S E R V, servepro.com. Check them out online today. Great to have ServPro a part of Dog Nation Daily here today. And uh, when you've got something to clean up, fire, water, intrusion, something like that, the restoration specialists of ServPro want to take good care of you on all of that. Connor Riley's going to help take good care of us here in a moment. We're going to talk some Georgia football with him coming up here in just a little bit. But prior to that, I want to go around the doghouse. And you know, we're at that kind of time of year where we're starting to see some of the preseason uh, projections come out. These aren't quite predictions as of yet, but these are just sort of projections. These are the sort of the mathematical data that will kind of give us some boundaries for the predictions everyone will eventually will make. And we did some of this last week or a couple of weeks ago now on our uh, Dog Nation roundtable we did while I was away from uh, Dog Nation Daily presented by Sir Pro for a few days uh, a couple of weeks ago about how Georgia might fare in the regular season, what the overall regular season record might be, and 
We heard a lot of our a lot of optimism from our Dog Nation folks, including Connor Riley, who'll join us here in a little bit. And it may not surprise you to find out that some of this optimism also reigns from other folks there as well, including uh, we're seeing a lot of the odds to win the SEC championship come out. I'm going to show you FanDuel here for no particular reason other than that this is just the one that I decided to pull. And what you see right now, these recently published for the first time, Georgia, the relatively sizable favorite here to win the SEC for the upcoming season. They're at plus 185. That's slightly less than 2-1 to one, and slightly ahead of the next best team in the SEC, which is uh, Texas, who's at about 3-1. to one. Then you get the third best odds for Ole Miss at 6.5-1. to one. How about this for the fact that Ole Miss, who does not have a lot of tangible accomplishments in its program's history, ahead right now of other teams in the SEC, both LSU and Alabama at 9.5-1, to one. Tennessee's 11 to 1, Missouri's at 15 to 1. Interesting that on paper, you know, Missouri and Ole Miss, pretty similar teams a year ago, similar records, and yet the perception about Ole Miss coming into the new season, so far ahead there of Missouri. Then you get to, like, say, Texas AM at 20 to 1, and then you get a little bit of a chasm after that where you get Oklahoma 40 to 1, Bam, I should say Auburn 50 to 1, Kentucky's at 90 to 1, South Carolina's 100 to 1. And then you get to the also rands of the SEC, such as Florida and Vanderbilt after that. But the point is, is that Georgia right now, a fairly sizable favorite to win this year's SEC, which is the kind of thing we've come to expect. We're sort of used to that. But the thing that I find to be interesting about that right now is, is that this is coming at a time in which the SEC as a league is completely different from what it's been in the past. This is a league that now officially adds both Texas and Oklahoma. This is a league that's doing away with division schedules. This is a league that by almost any measurement is getting tougher. And what I believe is, while it's fun in any year to have Georgia as the favorite win the SEC, if Georgia could win this year's SEC championship, I dare say it would be the most special SEC championship in the program's history, more special than what Georgia did in 2017 when it won the SEC for the first time under Kirby Smart, more special than what it did in 2022 when it came back to win the SEC, having lost in the SEC championship game the previous year to Alabama, that this would be the kind of accomplishment because of the nature of the SEC, the current landscape of college football where everything's just getting a little bit tougher for Georgia to rise to the occasion here this particular year. I think at least in terms of kind of the SEC level before you get to national championships, this would be about as significant as anything that Georgia has been able to do. And while Georgia probably won't speak much about this publicly, I don't think, because they have a tendency to keep this kind of stuff in house for the most part. I do think that could prove to be a, a nice piece of motivation for Georgia here this season that, Hey, you know, it's Texas in this league. Now you got to go to Texas. You know, nobody, you know, Georgia's on paper, never played a tougher schedule. You got to go to Alabama, Kalen DeBoer, getting to see Georgia come into Bryant Denny Stadium for his first ever SEC uh, game this September. I mentioned the Ole Miss team that's getting a lot of love right now. Georgia's got to go there in November. People are saying, can Georgia really navigate this tough of a schedule? Can Georgia really handle an SEC that's this much deeper and this much more competitive than it's ever been before? To win the SEC championship, what a uh, level of motivation that might be to sort of prove how ready Georgia is for what's coming next here in college football. And the idea that Georgia might use this for motivation, we do have some example from the past that that really might be something that Georgia might be willing to do and might seek out to do. I'm remembering a, an appearance that Kirby Smart made on SportsCenter back during the 2022 season when Scott Van Pelt became one of the first to really sort of broach the subject with Kirby about what if you really did win back-to-back -back national championships, something that Georgia obviously would go on to do. And while Kirby had been sort of asked these questions before, he was perhaps a little bit more willing to entertain that question because he's on Sports Center. He feels like a lot of people are watching him. Kirby sort of always kind of enjoys that kind of media, perhaps a little bit more than the sort of you know regular press conference style conversations. And Kirby Smart kind of pivoted away from the notion of a back-to-back -back national championship during that interview and pivoted back to the idea, as I said before, of winning an SEC championship in 2022 because Georgia had not done that in 2021. I want you to listen to this as a reminder. This is the audio from Kirby Sports Center appearance back in November of 2022. And the thing I want you to ask yourself while you're listening to this is, 
is if Georgia would use this as motivation back then, the notion of it would be special to win an SEC championship, isn't there a chance that same kind of idea could be re-racked this year because of just how challenging this new version of the SEC really is? Listen to this from Kirby from back then and see if you think it's relevant for today. Here's Kirby Smart. A lot of these teams that we've seen since the playoffs started are there every year, right? But we haven't had a repeat. The idea that that could be done again, something that hasn't been done yet, how, how much of a, of, of a sort of ring does that represent at the end of the line for you? Yeah, that, that is awesome, Scott, and that's, that's awesome. But that's the last thing from our mind. I mean, I got really, it. I think this, team, th- this team's driving factor is they really want to win an SEC championship. And you can't okay. really do that without winning in Starkville because they want to do something last year's team didn't do, and we didn't win the SEC last year. So it's one step at a time, and you can't win the SEC until you win the SEC East, and that starts with winning in Starkville. Kirby references Starkville there because that was the next game on the Georgia schedule at the time at Mississippi State, but there's a lot of candor there of this team wants to win an SEC championship. The 2021 team, they won a national championship, uh, but they didn't win the SEC championship. So this is this team's way of being different than the team in 2021. And we took that motivation for Georgia very seriously. They went on to win the SEC championship game by, what, you know, three touchdowns, whatever it was, and then went on to win that second straight national championship. But Kirby acknowledged, openly admitted, that there was some motivation to win an SEC championship. And once again, I'll ask the same question again, is if that was motivation for Georgia then, how much more motivating could this year be? Because Georgia also finds itself once again in the position of not being the reigning SEC champs and perhaps wondering you know, how they'll fare in an SEC now that includes the Texas and uh, the Oklahomas, but also the new look Alabama and everything else. Is Georgia still top dog in this league? The chance to prove that for Georgia, I think, could also be very motivating here for the 2024 season. And that is around the doghouse here on Dog Nation Daily presented by ServPro here today. Now, we're going to keep the Georgia conversation going, both with a look at some of this kind of stuff, but also more of what happened with the NFL scouting combine there as well, the Georgia players that helped themselves, the overall narrative that sort of exists around the program after an event like this. We're going to cover all of those bases and more as we welcome in Connor Riley today here to Dog Nation Daily, presented by ServPro. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. We will say hello to Connor Riley here, uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Serve Pro today. And, Connor, I just made the case that because of what the SEC looks like it could be, the fact that Georgia is still listed as a pretty sizable favorite to win this conference here this season, I take that as, as pretty substantive. I think, I think that matters. And I believe that if Georgia could win the SEC this year, this is sort of a weirdly hyperbolic thing to say, but it would be the most significant SEC championship that Georgia's ever won in its program history because the SEC's never been tougher. On paper, Georgia's never played a schedule that's tougher. I think there'd be some real meaning to an SEC championship this year before you even get to 12-team playoff and the possibility of a third national championship for the Kirby Smart era. Do you agree with me that there's significance in the SEC because of what the SEC is now? Yeah, B.A., first of all, I'm thrilled to be here, you know, opting in and focusing on <laughs> what we're doing here uh, as opposed to just playing football on the field. Uh, we'll get there back, before we're done today, I promise you. I go back to December, and you think of that loss to Alabama, and, and I think the sort of motivating factor that that impact has had on the team. Yes, it, it you know, prevented Georgia from winning a national championship, but the fact that they once again – came up short to Alabama in that game. I know that there are some people that think, you know, winning at Alabama on September 28th would be better than revenge. But I can tell you, Kirby Smart is going to do everything he can to win the SEC championship. That game still means a lot to him. I do believe he's genuine when he's wondered about, you know, the expanded playoff and the impact that that has on the SEC championship game. And so the fact that Georgia will go on the road to Texas, on the road, uh, to Alabama at Kentucky at Ole Miss where smart where sparks will fly. I do think that, you know, this game specifically the sec championship and the ability to win it means a lot to Kirby smart. And you've seen, as you just laid out that when that doesn't happen for these Georgia teams, it, it is sort of a motivating factor carrying into the next season. And, and so 
you know, I think, you know, you think big wins under Kirby Smart, the ones that he really remembers, you know, that first SEC championship win over Auburn. Conversely, you look at some of the impact the losses in that game have had. Uh, I do believe if Georgia doesn't uh, beat Alabama, uh, if Georgia, you know, had maybe won the SEC championship in 2021, maybe we don't see that same hungry Georgia team uh, go out and dominate Michigan in the manner in which they did in the 2021 college football playoff. Uh, you saw them lose to Texas in that Sugar Bowl after how deflating that 2018 SEC championship game was. This game means a lot for Georgia, and obviously, you know, Georgia's goal is to win each of these games. But I can tell you, look, there are going to be national media pundits talking right now. I've, I've gone on record. I've been, you know, the big boy that has predicted that Georgia's going to go 12-0 this you season. sure have. And there, there will be, you know, national media pundits wondering, oh, should, should Georgia, you know, play their guys and go out there and try and win this game? In my opinion, there are absolutely going to be a Georgia team that is hungry, wanting to win that game because of how much Georgia means uh, or how much that means to Georgia and specifically winning an SEC championship for Georgia means for Kirby Smart, regardless of what it means to everyone else out there. Kirby Smart's goal every year is to make sure that his team wins an SEC championship. And then, you know, college football playoff, national championship stuff, that all comes later. So I'm listening to you, and I don't know that I've ever really considered it this way, but one of the things that kind of comes to mind for me as, as I'm hearing you talk is, is, you know, the idea that Georgia has used negative motivation very well in the past. You know, the, the pain of losing the SEC championship in 2021, perhaps that was kind of part of the reason for firing off against Michigan so well to start that game in the Orange Bowl. The pain of not winning the SEC championship in 2021 worked for the 2022 SEC championship. And, you know, the idea that so many people picked against Georgia before playing Tennessee that same season, the fact that Georgia was only the preseason number three team, that somehow negative motivation seems to be pretty efficient fuel for UGA overall. However, in 2023, it was more about the idea of positive motivation of, you have a chance to obtain history, third straight national championship. No one's ever really done that and anything we would consider the modern era. And there's a way of looking at it. I don't know if this is true or not, but there's a way of looking at it that positive motivation didn't quite work for Georgia as well as negative motivation had worked the previous year. Do you understand what I'm saying? And do you agree that that's true? Yeah. Uh, I watched uh, the 1997 classic rounders recently, and oh, there was yeah. a line of Every great poker player, you know, they're not going to be able to recall the, the big hands that they won or they lucked into. But with painstaking detail, they can recall every single big hand that they've lost. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to your point there about negative motivation, look, you've seen Kirby come out with a certain controlled rage. You know, you think that Tennessee game, the way Georgia played there that day, uh, that Michigan game there as well. I think that just for whatever reason, and we wrote about this last season, Georgia just runs better on doubt. And when there's any sort of public doubt, Kirby Smart, we've seen, will latch on to that and have his team sort of beat you into submission for 60 minutes. And to quote another classic, you know, it is Oscars week here, drink your milkshake. Right. And so we've seen Georgia do that. And I'll be interested in seeing how they go about doing it this season and incorporating that because, well, I don't think that's the reason they lost to Alabama, you know, the lack of, of public doubt um, because some of us did predict that Alabama was going to win that game made a nice little uh, chunk of change that, that weekend. I, I do think that, you know, Georgia has got to find different ways to get itself motivated because I think you're right as well, as well as putting up uh, and using doubt as a fuel that's going to be harder to come by moving forward. And so, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily positive reinforcement, but Georgia's got to find a way to, to ratchet up that intensity when needed, when it's not going to be doubted, because those opportunities are, as we've seen, especially in the 2023 season, are just few and far between. We had a little bit of an issue. We had a file corrupted on the clip we tried to play to begin the show of Shane Beamer being upset about, uh, about James Coley. You wrote about it at dognation.com. People should check that out there if they want to, hear more of what we weren't able to kind of execute a little earlier. But my point is, what do you think about all that? I, 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 perhaps my take on this is a little bit different than some Georgia fans is what do you make of James Coley being, I should say Shane Beamer being so honest about his displeasure with James Coley leaving the way that he did and kind of suggesting that he's unhappy with Georgia in all of that too. What do you make of that? It's not, it hasn't been a secret that uh, Kirby Smart and Shane Beamer aren't exactly the closest of coaches. And I think this is maybe another example of that just sort of being aired publicly. 
uh, you understand uh, certainly why Shane Beamer would be upset losing a quality coach in James Coley, a guy that he thought would be a plus add to his program. And, and then, you know, sort of getting big void, uh, bamboozled maybe even uh, in, in losing him so quickly and then having to go out and hire a D2 coach. Uh, I think it speaks to maybe the respect uh, that Shane Beamer had or maybe no longer has for James Coley in terms of bringing him in, putting a, a sizable buyout into his contract and, and then still seeing him leave uh, in short order for Georgia. It, it speaks to Georgia's a better job than South Carolina. It's always going to be that way. Uh, I, I will say, you know, Georgia and South Carolina had played every year when they were SEC East rivals. They're not going to do that anymore. And while South Carolina has been super competitive with Georgia uh, since Kirby Smart has taken over, um, I, I do kind of wish these two teams would play more going forward because I actually do think that Beamer maybe has South Carolina going in the right direction. He experienced, I think, some some growing pains this past season. But uh, it's very clear in my mind that these two teams do not like each other. And I think Shane Beamer felt no issue uh, sort of airing those qualms. And the fact that maybe he doesn't have to play Georgia every year now moving forward, maybe frees him up even more to sort of voice those frustrations that he has with Kirby Smart and the Georgia program. And here's the other point for me, and I know this may sound a little bit weird. It's like, I, I love Kirby Smart. Obviously, if you're a Georgia fan, you would. But I don't want every coach to be like Kirby Smart. You know, Kirby keeps cards very close to the vest. And I would say that if every coach was a carbon copy of Kirby, then the sport would be less entertaining. Like Shane Beamer being willing to wear his emotions on his sleeve about this or perhaps other topics, I think that makes college football more fun. Frankly, it makes me respect Beamer more because I think he kind of comes from an honest place. I've grown to feel that way about Eli Drinkwitz a little bit too. You know, there's the thing out there right now about Drinkwitz, you know, saying to uh, Josh Heupel after last year's game, you know, we stand on business. And the fact that Drinkwitz sort of shrugged it off saying, I did that because my players wanted me to. And you know, that's a little bit of a weird thing to do. It's the kind of thing that Kirby Smart would never do. I don't want Kirby Smart to be like Drinkwitz or Beamer, but I don't really want Drinkwitz and Beamer and guys like that to sort of feel like they have to be like Kirby Smart either. I like the varying personalities that college football can provide. And for a while, it seemed like there was sort of only one archetype for coach. And I think that makes the sport a little bit more boring overall. I think that Kirby's got the right personality for him, but I'm really glad there's room for – what used to be an Ed Orgeron or what is a Shane Beamer now, or what could be an Eli Drinkwitz or, you know, got, you know, guys like that. I like a little personality in my coaches. It makes the sport more entertaining. And from that standpoint, I'm probably not as angry about some of this as maybe some Georgia fans who I think rightly view, you know, Beamer being kind of an enemy of Kirby. I, I probably don't get as upset at Shane Beamer as some Georgia fans do. I'm going to walk a very delicate line here. I'm going to throw out a name who you, you made a good bit of money off of. And I'm sure, you know, like, look, Georgia, Florida rivalry is your biggest thing. It, yeah. it is the thing you own. You'd, you'd walk over broken glass to get Dan Mullen back as the head coach at Florida, as opposed to Billy Napier, who is much more buttoned up, not mm -hmm. going to say anything, things along the lines of that. Conversely, obviously, you'd wish he'd had more success if he were your coach. But if Dog Nation Daily had a coach like a Dan Mullen type, like an Eli Drinkwitz type, I think even like a Shane Beamer type with Kirby Smart's results, man, I think you'd have a ton of fun doing that show. <laughs> and just in general, you know, and again, Kirby Smart, it's work for him. There's no doubting it. I will just say as a fan of the sport, as a fan of sport in general, Sports are more fun when we have villains. Sports are better when we have guys to root against. And, and you know, Steve uh, Steve Spurrier is a, the most classic example of this. You know, that emotional, going to tell you exactly what is on his mind. And, you know, Kirby Smart is a villain in, I think, a different sense for a lot of teams and that he, like Nick Saban, is just so, has built such a juggernaut uh, that, you know, you just naturally root against them because they're the biggest and baddest team in the sport. But having coaches like Eli Drinkwitz, who, as you see there, may may come up with a good quip. Steve Spurrier obviously famously did that. Uh, having Lane Kiffin types, yeah. I, I think, is just better for the sport. And, and so, yes, Kirby Smart winning has led to him doing being able to do whatever he wants and treat people and react however he so pleases. But, man, it'd, it'd be a lot more fun if we had coaches throwing barbs at each other and, 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 and engaging, I think, in things like this moving forward. Just because I think that sort of builds more interest to the casual fan. 
you know, it's easier to sell to your mom or dad, hey, uh, Shane Beamer was saying th some things about the Georgia football program. And when those two teams play, there's maybe a more easier to follow storyline than, oh, Kirby Smart's trying to win his 30th, 31st, 32nd league game in a row. Yeah, I think I, I think that's a fair point. I really do. Now, to shift gears here for a moment, NFL scouting combine last week. I liked your winners and losers column about that up at dognation.com. I thought it kind of framed it all in a pretty interesting way. And yesterday I said, if, if I could only sort of winnow this down to one thing, the thing that probably mattered to me more than anything else in the combine was the reaction that Demarius Mims got, that people were just simply wowed by the scarcity of an athlete who looks this way. What I said yesterday was, you know, that ought to be a reminder to Georgia that, you know, the athletic big men, that's what you want the calling card of your program to be because – that's the thing that also allows you to step out from the rest of your competition there as well. But beyond that, or perhaps including that, who were some of the other sort of winners from a Georgia perspective when it comes to the uh, combine for you? I think all three defensive backs had a really strong showing at the combine. Kamari Lassiter had the best three cone drill of anyone at the combine with the six, six two didn't run in the 40 yard dash, which I know disappointed some people, but you have Tyke Smith and Javon Bullard, both running sub four fives. I, I think a lot of people were surprised by that. And so all three of those guys helped themselves. Lad McConkey had did everything he needed to do at the combine ran a four, three, nine, 40, showed out really well in the gauntlet drill, did everything he needed to do. And in most years, I think we'd be talking about him now as a surefire first round pick after that combine. Unfortunately for him, I think there were some wide receivers that just had better days than he did, which I think speaks to the overall depth and strength of impact of this wide receiver class. A.D. Mitchell, who there, there was some interesting chatter um, about the Georgia wide receiver room in recent years, because and look, I've been as guilty of this as anybody. And so in terms of talking about the strength or lack of strength in that room, when you have A.D. Mitchell there and you have Lad McConkey and you have Jermaine Burton and you have Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint. Those are all guys that Georgia identified and in some way developed into being NFL caliber wide receivers. And, and it, I think forces you to go back and look at say that 2021 team and part of that 2022 team as well. And just look at the overwhelming array of, of talented options they had on the offensive side of the ball. We talked so much about that Georgia defense that year, but Georgia had quite a bit of talented skill players on that 2021 team as well. George Pickens, though he obviously missed time. Brock Bowers is going to be a first round pick. James Cook's already a pro bowler at the NFL level. They had so much talent on the offensive side of the ball. And I think that really reminded itself this weekend. And then obviously touching on Amarius Mims here to close. Again, like 6'8", 340 pounds, 5'07", 40. Uh, there was a, a snafu with his uh, his short shuttle, which he did not run, but it was attributed to a 4'3", 3, which is insane. And that's why it ultimately was proven not to be true. But <laughs> Like, uh, you know, I, I threw out some descriptors, uh, a T-800, the, the original Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. Terminator, uh, just a perfect size there. 36-inch arms, 11-inch hands. I know for most people, the, the numbers sort of, you know, your eyes glaze over them. Those are insane measurables. And, and so, you know, Georgia recruits elite players all the time and, and whatnot. Amarius Mims is a true, like, 1%, 0.01% athlete. And the fact that there were times during the 2022 season – when Georgia had a Marius Mims and Darnell Washington on the field together, that is just a ton of unreal size. And, and so to your larger point about that, you know, Mims is going to be a first round draft pick despite starting eight career games at Georgia and dealing with injuries and having a fair amount of questions about him. I think it speaks to the point of, and Georgia does this as well as anybody identifying just really special athletes and being like, Hey, we're going to figure a way to not mess it up, which is, which happens more surprisingly than you think with five-star players. Mm -hmm. So the fact that even though, you know, Amarius Mims, if you redo his career at Georgia, I don't know, probably eight, eight, nine times, it goes better than it actually did for him. The fact that he's still going to be a first round pick obviously speaks to the unique prospect that Mims is, but also just how good Georgia is at getting the most out of every single player, whether it be an Amarius Mims type or a Jordan Davis type who, you know, had incredible size, but arrived as an unheralded three-star prospect uh, at a high school. So I said this yesterday, tell me if you agree that, and it's certainly not the case that I'd turned down Julian Juju Lewis, no one would, but to show you how like, I think meaningful this conversation is I, I said yesterday, you know, we just saw Elijah Griffin drop a top 12. We saw David Sanders drop a top six. I would take either Sanders or Griffin as a recruit over Lewis right now. I believe for Georgia and the brand that I believe is important for Georgia to establish the value of the big athlete like Sanders or the big athlete like Griffin, that's more valuable right now than 
perhaps the most talked about recruit of the Dog Nation era, a guy like you know Julian Juju Lewis. Would you take it as far as I am right there? I'm actually going to take it one step further. I don't just agree with you that landing those big bodied hulks, you know, they already have justice Terry in this yeah. class. Uh, David Sanders is a good one. Jalen Matthews is another offensive tackle worth keeping tabs on. I'll even go with just the quarterback position. Give me Matt Zoller's over Juju Lewis, because I think Zoller's has bigger physical traits. And I'm a guy who, when, when evaluating prospects and looking at them, certainly through an NFL lens, You know, what we saw with Bryce Young this past year, and he was in an awful situation in Carolina, it sort of just reinforces, give me the biggest guys possible. Just give me, you know, size, athleticism, and and the ability to coach them up. And and so that's why you see, I I think we talk so much about an Elijah Griffin, and we talk so much about a David Sanders Jr. There's just certain things that you cannot teach or you cannot, you know, get by with. And, And Juju Lewis phenomenal player if you were to stay all four years or play four years at the georgia high school level would we'll probably rewrite the record books but uh, you know sometimes you know that skill level doesn't necessarily translate especially right away when adjusting to a different level of competition so if you're giving me a choice to take traits or production i'm gonna lean traits and so for juju lewis while he is a phenomenal quarterback a very gifted player or pastor someone i know georgia would love to have in this class You know, Matt Zollers, in my opinion, is just as worthy of following. And because of his upside, because of the physical traits that he has, I'm actually a little bit more interested in him than I am in Juju Lewis. As much as I know that Lewis coming might have a bigger impact on the way Georgia recruits for the 2025 recruiting cycle. I tell you what, Connor, it's really fun stuff. Very, very interesting. We appreciate your time here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Serve Pro to talk about it all. We know you've got some great stuff coming at dognation.com very soon there as well. And thank you, unlike Arch Manning, for opting in to our conversation today as opposed to opting out to focus in on something like playing on the field, which you're not going to be doing anyway. Yep, Story of Us is always a great one. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to playing NCAA this summer and as always being on with you on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Tuesday good, morning. Good stuff, yeah. Connor. Appreciate your time. And as always, it was a pleasure. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, we'll get to we will get to the art story here coming up in uh, just a moment. First, let me remind folks we're going to go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And listen, I am definitely opting in when it comes to allure of the seas in our Dog Nation cruise coming up in April. And you know why I'm so excited about it because listen, we we knew we had a real challenge in 2024 after having an incredibly successful kind of first two years of our Dog Nation cruise, like any great sequel. Connor was talking to movies a moment ago. Like any great sequel, you kind of want to take it to the next level, bigger and better. And so one of the questions we asked was, okay, well, how do you make Dog Nation cruise bigger and better here in 2024? And the resounding answer was, you've got to do it on one of the biggest ships you can find. You've got to do it on an Oasis-class ship, such as Allure of the Seas. And boy, I tell you, just talked to a guy yesterday, just got back from Allure of the Seas, talking about how much fun it was he said my only complaint is i just wish it was longer which means he was having a uh, great great time obviously not ready to get off the ship when that cruise was done and so you get the same chance to experience the same type of thing whether it's the dog nation cruise coming up with us in april or the other and i do think this is a really cool thing because listen my daughter's into gymnastics my son's playing on like 15 different baseball teams you know my wife's got stuff going on i've got stuff going on you know finding that time away for the full seven day seven night cruise obviously that's our favorite kind of cruise to take is the full week, the seven-night cruise. But at this stage of our life, sometimes the convenience of a three- or a four-night cruise out of Port Canaveral, which is the port closest to where we live here in the Atlanta area, sometimes that just makes more sense. And so the fact now that Royal Caribbean says, hey, for those kind of traveling into Port Canaveral to be a part of that, uh, we're going to give you the Oasis-class ships for those three- and four-night sailings. I think that's awesome. In fact, in July, it's the debut of Utopia of the Seas, the brand-new Oasis-class ship sailing out of Port Canaveral uh, on those three and four nights. I it's a really fun new chapter in Royal Caribbean's history there at Port Canaveral, which I sort of consider my home port. So Jessica Slater, a great travel agent, can tell you all you need to know about this. You give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. Tell her, B.A. said, Allure of the Seas, Oasis-class ships, Dog Nation cruise, debut of Utopia of the Seas, all kinds of fun stuff going on as it relates to Royal Caribbean and all kinds of things you're going to want to opt in on. That, however, is not apparently the case for Arch Manning, who is choosing reportedly in a way to opt out of the EA Sports College football video game. The deal here is 
that every player was going to get, I think it's 600 bucks and a copy of the game for their willingness to opt in the game. And basically, you know, thousands of players are kind of choosing to do that. Overwhelmingly, players seem to be more than happy to be a part of the game and get some compensation for doing so. Anwar Richardson, I believe, was the first to report that Arch Manning is not going to do that for Texas. Now, here's the deal. I think there's a lot that you can kind of take from this. First of all, you know, I think it kind of speaks to the difference between perception and reality when it comes to college sports overall as it relates to, like, say, the EA Sports video game. You know, when the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit first took place, you know, I think there was this real attempt to sort of cast college sports in the role of oppressor over the athletes. Oh, it's taking advantage of the athletes. You know, it's it, it's using them for, for a, you know, a lack of sufficient, you know, compensation. But ultimately what you find out is, is the whole EA Sports video game, which essentially went away for a decade because of stuff like the O'Bannon trial, the actual amount of money we're talking about here is not in the millions. I mean, people have this sort of like, you know, fantastical idea of how much their presence in a video game like this is perhaps worth. It's worth a few hundred dollars. When you look at the total number of sales that EA Sports does and the total number of players in the game and the fact there's not one person anywhere that would choose not to buy the game because so-and-so is not in it, including Arch Manning, by the way. You're led to believe that the actual economic value of someone's so-called NIL in this game is perhaps a little bit smaller than some people were first sort of pontificating about when the Ed O'Bannon trial and the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit first took place, the former UCLA basketball player who sort of started all of this. And so I think that's an important reality to confront here is that things like this just aren't worth as much as you think they're worth or, you know, what you might think it would be worth on behalf of some players. Just not. Uh, a lot of that you know stuff is just... You know, greatly exaggerated and the actual payments and the willingness of players to take those payments when it comes to the uh, EA Sports video game kind of proves how true that is. But in the case of Arch Manning, I got to tell you, as someone who's a traditionalist and wants to maintain, you know, the, the kind of essence of college sports to the extent that it can be maintained, I don't really have a problem with Arch Manning not wanting to be a part of this game because here is the reality. While for 90 to 95% of the players in college football, the regular deal they already get is probably about as good a deal as they're ever going to get, whether it be you know, the, the, the value you get from playing college athletics or the small amount of compensation you get for being a part of the video game. That's about as good of an amount of compensation as you can hope to get. They're always going to be a tiny group of outliers for whom that's not true. And we've got no problem around here saying that Arch Manning's one of those guys, not because of how good of a player he is, because actual value is not necessarily always demonstrated by talent. Your actual value is sort of demonstrated by your marketability. And obviously in the case of Manning, he has a very famous last name attached to him. Maybe he turns out to be the kind of player that lives up to that last name, or maybe he doesn't. But there is no doubt that part of Manning's value is his last name, the same way it would be true for, like, Bronny James or Shador Sanders or any other athlete who happens to have a very famous father or a fam be a part of a very famous family, that marketability sometimes is just sort of attached to how well people know you and people already feel like they know Arch Manning very well, despite the fact that he hasn't played at Texas. So, you know, do we take Arch Manning at his word that what Richardson reported was is that uh, he wants to focus on football on the field? You know, he wants to focus on that. You know, that that doesn't seem all that believable to me. I think that Manning believes he's worth more than the small amount of money he'd be paid to be in this video game. And he's probably right. Uh, he probably is the one of the very small number of athletes who should probably consider holding out because one of these days, he's the kind of person who could be on the cover of a video game like this. And perhaps he's laying the groundwork to demand more money if that is indeed ever the case. And given his level of fame, that's probably the kind of thing that he has a reasonable consideration to, to, to probably wonder about. But 90-something percent of the rest of college football is just not in the same category. They know that as players, and that's why they're sort of willing to take the deal that's out there. Manning sort of knows he's different, and we don't have a problem with him being treated different given the fact that as an athlete he's sort of in a special category. So this is one of those deals where people will still buy the video game without Arch Manning, but Manning can probably you know, rightfully believe that his actual value is probably a little higher than what the video game was willing to pay him. And this is the sort of thing you move on from. It's kind of the same deal with like, what's it, like Barry Bonds was never a part of the Major League Baseball Players Association or like Michael Jordan was never in NBA Jam. Isn't that true? Jordan was never in NBA Jam. Am I, 
Yeah, I'm being told by uh, yeah Cody, who also kind of remembers the '90s like me, uh, that uh, that that Jordan was never in that game. Like we've had this thing happen in sports before. We just sort of move on. People still love the game, whether Jordan was in it or not, and people will still love EA Sports College Football, whether Arch Manning is in it or not. And Manning is probably one of those small athletes in the sport, small number of athletes. I mean, who really could perhaps hold out for greater value in the future, and we'll see if he's ever able to actually get it. Moving on, Alabama has now started uh, its spring practice, and interesting to think that for the very first time it's doing so without Nick Saban at the helm. And it's about to get real, real, real quick for Alabama here as we get ready to find out uh, you know, just exactly what this program is going to look like. Some examples of Kalen DeBoer choosing to run things a little bit differently but the results are obviously expected to be the same. You know, I talked about this off the top of the program, or at least near the top of the program, that when you look at, you know, the fan duel odds when the SEC, you still see Alabama pretty prominently mentioned near the top, but not at the very top the way you would have seen them in the past. Right now, by perception, they're well behind Georgia. They're well behind the team that beat them a year ago, Texas. But they're also well behind a team like Ole Miss, who typically is never ahead of Alabama. In anything, they're kind of right there in a glut that includes LSU and slightly ahead of Tennessee. And that sort of speaks to the first-year challenge awaiting Kalen DeBoer as they get going with spring practice here right now. You know, is this the the you know the kind of coach who's ready to sort of meet the moment at Alabama where at Washington you play for a national championship one time, you could have probably bought yourself – you know, a, a ticket to whatever success you want to enjoy for the to the, the rest of your time as a coach. But at Alabama, you're sort of expected to do things like that each and every year. DeBoer, by resume, is about as good a coach as Alabama could be hired. But does his personality meet the moment here? Is DeBoer, you know, ready to kind of live in a world in which expectations are so high? The only way to find that out is to watch how this year plays out. And this 2024 season where Alabama is beginning right now, as their spring practice uh, gets rolling. I'll finish with this. There's been some chatter as of late. Cole Kublik's been talking about this. Andy Stable's been talking about this. But the whole idea of the eruption that's still yet to come in college football and the talk about the 14-team playoff you know, last week, kind of a precursor to that, that some of this is going to happen sooner rather than later, perhaps during this offseason, we might find out about new sort of seismic shifts coming and the idea that there's a breakaway from the NCAA and that super conferences are on the way and that more of kind of the, I guess, molding of college football into something that looks a lot more like the NFL, that could perhaps be on the way. So I don't really know what to say about too much of this right now other than the fact that college football fans who've been asked to brace for change over and over again over the course of the last couple of years perhaps could be ready to brace for some more change moving forward. My guess is this is not the last time we talk about any of that. But for now, we'll make this cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And before we wrap up here today, I want to give a shout-out to the program to our friends at Mr. Electric, Dog Nation's choice for all your residential and commercial electrical needs. They've been in business for nearly 30 years, which is an incredible track record of success, multiple decades like that. They do repair work. They do installations. And they're big in, like, the world of electrical safety. That's one of the most important things. When you welcome in someone to your property to do work for you, understanding their commitment to safety, that's just one of the ways that you can have peace of mind of, well, listen, if, if they're taking good care of themselves from a safety standpoint, perhaps that also indicates they're going to take good care of my property and take good care of my needs there as well. They've also got a team of licensed experts. They're insured electricians there as well. And they've got upfront flat rate pricing, which is a very valuable thing. And uh, that's true even when it comes to that $29 service fee. That actually gets waived anytime you get some repair work done. So a good deal from our friends at Mr. Electric there on that. So whether you need 24-hour emergency service or you just need a quote, Mr. Electric has got you covered. So make sure you find them online. It's Mr. Electric Atlanta.com. That's Mr. Electric Atlanta.com. Make sure you check them out today. So yesterday we talked about the really cool thing with the Diamond Dogs getting the season sweep against Georgia Tech, the weekend sweep there against Georgia Tech. And on Saturday, they'd given out the Harry Dog bobbleheads of Harry Dog sort of swinging the bat in kind of a home run pose. And we kind of wondered if anybody was there and able to get one of those. Tiffany Ard uh, says she was there. She says, hey, I'm going to share with you 
the Harry Dog bobblehead from the UGA baseball game there on Saturday. She got herself a couple of those. She says it's a great souvenir and a great win for the dog. You better believe that it is. How much do you love that bobblehead? Uh, that is awesome to be able to see. Uh, you love Harry Dog and the kind of the home run pose there. Really cool giveaway from the Diamond Dogs there on that. My son, as I told you, he was so disappointed when he found out they were giving this away at a game he wasn't able to go to. He had a baseball game of his own there on Saturday. But certainly a really cool thing to be able to see. So, Tiffany, thanks for sharing those. How about our Gator Hater Updater? We laughed at Florida yesterday. We can laugh at them pretty much any day. 1,214 days. That's how long it's been since they have beaten Georgia. That is our Gator Hater Updater. We'll see all of you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Serpro. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And on video, time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, when you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust R.S. Andrews on all of that today. All right, so I promised our Dog Nation folks I would start with them to begin with today. Because we had a little bit of an issue there on that. We're also being told that Facebook is down. Not our fault, but uh, Zuckerberg's fault there on that. So there you go on that front. So we'll do dognation.com, and we'll do YouTube, and we'll take those here today. So apparently Zuckerberg having a pretty bad day. Um, Matt Rukavina says, Facebook melting down notwithstanding. Spring practice and the game are sneakily creeping up on us all. Yeah, we're looking forward to a fun March here. And heading into April too, Matt, you're right about that. Um, DT says, we're happy to have the Facebookers over here. So there you go. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Uh, BMAC says, is this Arch's second or third season? He'll be going into year two. And, you know, I do think, as it stands right now, Manning is expected to be the backup quarterback to Quinn Ewers. And perhaps, and probably likely so, that's the way that it will remain, barring injury. But I do wonder, if just given some of what I saw, especially late in the season from Ewers a year ago, if the door couldn't be open maybe a little bit more for uh, Manning to find some playing time here this year and kind of what the expectation there is in Austin on all of that. Uh, Scott Harris says that five-star receivers are prima donnas. I would say that sometimes the receiver position has earned that reputation for a reason, but I would say in some cases perhaps that's not always true as well. Um, let's see what else is going on. Um. Uh, BMAC says how times have changed since Kirby came to UGA. He's created more turmoil in the SEC than almost any other coach. Yeah, uh, he's certainly making his enemies mad, which means he's probably doing something right. Um, Senior Dog 54 says, I don't see where it's a big deal whether we have a 1,000-yard receiver or not. Just win, baby. I understand that. I think the argument that some people would make is, now I, I, I feel like overall Georgia's offensive production has probably been certainly good enough but when Georgia found itself in trouble against Alabama, the argument that some people are going to make, and you can decide for yourself if you agree with this or not, but the argument that some people are going to make is if Georgia did have the 1,000-yard archetype of a 1,000-yard receiver, the kind of playmaker that creates separation, that maybe Georgia could have more easily found the kind of offensive plays that would have given them a better chance against Alabama. That's what it comes down to. This is not – the sort of style in which you win, this is the style which makes winning a little bit easier. That's what it, you know, that's what it comes down to. The ability to sort of throw those big punches offensively, I think in the eyes of some, just makes winning a little bit easier. We would say that one of the reasons that Georgia has won national championships, both 2021 and 2022, is perhaps because it had more offensive firepower than it was sometimes given credit for. Maybe it was true last year than the game that mattered most against Alabama. They just didn't quite have enough of that. Or SEC games that could have easily been lost. It's like South Carolina and Auburn near the beginning of the year. Once again, that firepower wasn't quite emerging. And, you know, Georgia had to really kind of be saved by Brock Bowers. And certainly the Auburn game, the South Carolina game, I'm a hard time to remember. But certainly the Auburn game had to really be saved by Bowers because if it wasn't him, who was it going to be? Um, Scott Harris asked an interesting question. We kind of wrestled with this a little bit whether a good recruiter pre-NIL is the same thing as a good recruiter post-NIL. And I would say, Scott, that on the one hand, the presence of NIL has changed the recruiting process because ultimately a lot of the 
top recruits are going to be very interested in the NIL figure. But here is why I think the notion of a good recruiter, and this is someone who kind of relates relentlessly, someone who is relentless in forming relationships. This is why I think that kind of version of the good recruiter still matters. The example I've used before is if I took my phone out and if I clicked my email, I could click the promotional email, the stuff that I don't ever see that just sort of gets funneled to like the promotional tab. And it's all these offers from all these companies. And not only will I not engage with the company over the offer, I won't even open the email because the assumption we all have is, is that anything like that is probably too good to be true. And therefore it's safer not to connect at all. Because if you're offering me something that's too good to be true, then what you really want from me, you're not telling me the truth about. You're kind of keeping that a secret. That's the perception that we sometimes have about stuff like this, is that, you know, offers that I have a tendency to gain from financially come across as too good to be true. I don't trust the person making that offer. Well, the comparison to recruiting is obvious, is that, you know, so-and-so school wants to give me a million dollars. But if I don't know the coach, if I don't know the program, if I don't know the backstory there, I'm also going to be, at least if I'm wise, I'm going to assume that's probably too good to be true. But if it's position coach like the ones that Georgia has a tendency to employ, who are great at forging relationships, who stay in constant contact, even after the player tells them they no longer want to come, they stay not in a pandering or I should say a pestering way, but in a, in a, in a relational way. All of a sudden now, when the NIL offer comes, maybe it's not quite as high as other programs, but I feel like I can take it to the bank that it's real. And that's where the ability to forge relationships is still really valuable. Players can trust, they at least they think they can, what the Georgia coaches are saying, and that probably is where a lot of that sort of comes from. All right. Uh, Matt Rukavine on the idea that Branson Robinson can be a part of a sort of one-two punch at running back with Trevor Etienne. As I've said over and over, I believe that Branson Robinson's future as a running back is probably just as bright now as it ever was. I would have some concerns about how healthy he could be for the 2024 season, and I'm sure we'll get more updates from Kirby on that uh, coming up in a couple of weeks when Georgia begins its spring practice, but the expectation I have is is that for the most part, you know, Branson is still going to be pretty hobbled, at least for a while. Uh, anything else at dognation.com before I move on? Uh, Richard D. says, if we had a player at wide receiver at the Harrison, uh, uh, like, like Harrison Jr. come to Athens, where would he go in the draft after being at Georgia? I mean, my assumption is, is that he'd be drafted just as high playing at Georgia as he would playing at Ohio State. It is probably true that Ohio State has featured its individual receivers you know, more so than Georgia has. But, you know, if Georgia had a Marvin Harrison Jr., my guess is they'd want to they'd want to really use him. And his talent level would probably shine in a place like Georgia just like it does at Ohio State. And, you know, when you look at how well Ladd is performing at the NFL scouting combine and how, you know, kind of sort of bright his draft future could be, I think you're reminded that you go back to 2021 when Ladd was playing – getting his time in the rotation, some people probably thought, well, that shouldn't be him. That should be me. But what we kind of find out is, is that part of the reason why Georgia stayed in a rotation and, you know, didn't give certain receivers all of the love they perhaps wanted to get. And some of those receivers ended up transferring, going elsewhere. Part of that's because they're just not better than Land McConkey that, you know, it's like, who was the, the, the recruit the other day? It was like, you know, I want to want to go to Georgia. All they do is throw to the tight end. But if you were as good as Brock Bowers, all they would do is throw to you. That that, you know, Georgia throws the ball to Bowers because Bowers is that good, and Georgia played Lad McConkey because that's what Lad McConkey was deserving of. And that if Georgia had Marvin Harrison Jr., they'd probably treat him like Marvin Harrison Jr. But you know, some of the guys at Georgia who haven't exactly been Marvin Harrison Jr., that's probably not Georgia's fault. Uh, just to be honest, let's see what else. Uh, let's see what else. Um, they're still in here arguing with G. Grace over on YouTube.
Uh, Paul Moon says, I'm glad that after Tyler Simmons was uh, falsely called off sides, we didn't, as a fan base, cry about it for literal years, go to other teams' podcasts to cry about it. I mean, here's what I'll tell you, is that I would put our behavior, my show's behavior, post Tyler Simmons, I would say that the audio or video of that still holds up very, very well. I, I, I would. I mean, we're obviously disappointed about it, uh, but we didn't make the the sole facet of our personality being upset about that. No, we didn't. Um, Daniel Nelson says, I still cry about it, to be honest. Well, there you go. Uh, Daniel, I understand where you're coming from there on that. Uh, Jacob says, it's wild over here today. Uh, Zebulon Owen says, Tyler Simmons was offsides, though, just saying. And there's nothing wrong with being upset about it and saying it was a bad call. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, I do believe as a fan base, while Georgia fans were upset about that and sort of turned that into a meme, you know, I think they took Kirby Smart's overall message to heart, which is we're not going anywhere. Now, if you really want to think about this, why did Alabama fans sort of kind of, I guess, self-immolate over the uh, uh, John Mechie and the Jameis Williams injuries in a way that Georgia didn't after 2017? Here's one of the reasons why I think that may be the case. Is that because Kirby, as a second-year coach, young, you know, full of energy, full of – you know, life could very easily say we're not going anywhere. But when Alabama lost in 2021, Nick Saban, and listen, you know, Father Time comes for us all, right? I mean, Father Time is, of course, undefeated. But Saban could not as easily say we're not going anywhere. In fact, that was sort of the last national championship game that Alabama ever played in, is that the reason why I think Alabama fans had to grab hold of the Williams uh, and the Mechie injury and just sort of hang on to that as an excuse so much is because they didn't have the rallying cry of, we're not going anywhere, we'll be back. The truth is they weren't back. They In the Nick Saban era, the era came to an end without Alabama ever playing for a national championship game ever again. Perhaps the same thing is true for Ohio State and the Marvin Harrison injury, that the reason why they grabbed hold of that, even though Ryan Day is a much younger man, Day's future in Columbus is very much in doubt. If they're not incredibly successful this year, Day could lose his job. It's one of the reasons why we would believe they've gone so all in on NIL because they know it's sort of now or never that with full confidence, Ryan Day couldn't say we're not going anywhere the way that Kirby Smart could in 2017 because Ryan Day can't be sure that he isn't going anywhere. Perhaps Ohio State hangs around, but Day perhaps is not the coach who's a part of all of that. So, There was a level of self-confidence that Georgia had after its bad call and disappointing moment in 2017 that, with good reason, Alabama could not have in 2021 and Ohio State could not have in 2022. Uh, Let us see what else. Uh, Memphis Dog says it seems strange that when Bama players get hurt, it's the fans doing the crying. Some of that may just, I mean, listen. As Georgia continues to win, the fan base is just going to get larger. And we're not against bandwagon fans. We think Georgia football is sort of the most fun pastime you can have. And for people who have not yet become Georgia fans who will, we think their lives will be better because of it. But as more and more people kind of come into the fan base, they will come into the fan base because it is a fan base that wins. And so, therefore, they will only think about Georgia football from the vantage point of, I'm here for the wins. Whereas the rest of us, most of us anyway, even if you're like in your 20s, you can follow Georgia back to a period where winning was not certain. And so there is just an additional perspective that exists there. I am not anti-bandwagon fans. I'm really not. I think I think that being a Georgia fan is a good thing. I can't wait to welcome new people into the Georgia football fan base. But it is a just a unavoidable fact that the overall conversation having ha- happening with some Georgia fans will change when new fans come in because they will come with a certain sense of entitlement because all they know is Georgia as a winner. That's the reason why they're here. Uh, and so, therefore, they feel like Georgia is entitled to victories. Otherwise, they'd go be a fan of something different. What I'm describing that will eventually happen for Georgia 
That is what's happened for Alabama is, I mean, you know, Alabama has a gigantic fan base, and some of that's because of heritage and history and Bear Bryant. But some of that's because they've won, and people like to be a part of a winning organization. They like to be on the winning side. And so some of the whole thing of, well, if Alabama lost, it must be an excuse. There must be some justifiable excuse. That's because there are people who only understand Alabama as a winner because they chose Alabama because it was, in their eyes and mind, a winner. And some of them don't remember the Mike Dubose, the Mike Shula or whatever his name was. They don't remember that era, or they just chose not to participate in that era. And so we'll see now what kind of happens to some of them. But uh, there's no doubt it is just a natural consequence of success. Your fan base gets larger, and some of the people who come into that fan base, I will welcome them with open arms here at Georgia, but some of the people who come into that fan base don't have the same frame of reference. Memphis Dog says he didn't mean to get me on a soapbox. I guess sometimes that's not too difficult to do. Um, Frank Patterson says if only Bryce Young had won as much as the mailman. And yeah, I mean, in the ongoing argument that takes place between Georgia fans and Alabama fans, that is important to know is that, you know, and some of this even came from Georgia fans. We had to endure a whole year of how much better Bryce Young was than Stetson Bennett. And Bennett, you know, put it in his eye again by winning another national championship. And yeah, that ought to be one of the very, in the sort of back and forth, you know, battle between you and Alabama fans, the fact that Bennett won two national championships and Bryce Young didn't win any, you absolutely should make that a big part of your overall discussion. Um, absolutely. Uh, let's see what else. Um, let's see what else is going on over here. Jacob says George is the new standard in college football. We would say that's the case. Um, Natalie says that Kalen DeBoer, uh, she says, did Kalen DeBoer inherit a referee trust fund uh, and support squad when he took the job? Natalie, that's very funny. Uh, That is very, very funny indeed. Um, Let's see what else. Um, Paul Moon says... um, the Bama fans are going to be a bad way uh, once, once the Kalen DeBoer thing goes south. Perhaps that's the case. Um, Stick D's wonders if there's a durability issue in Tuscaloosa given all the injuries that have gone on. That's kind of interesting uh, for sure. Uh, Barry Watkins, <laughs> who is normally a Facebook commenter who has traveled over to dognation.com today, uh, upon hearing about some of the mess over there on the YouTube side, says uh, he knew better than to go to YouTube. So there you go. Um uh, B Mac on the subject of the last game. So the 2021 national championship was Alabama's last national championship game. Uh, they never played a national championship game again after that. So that's why, you know, there was no, you know, we're not going anywhere because when it comes to a national championship game, they never appeared in one again. Um, Randy Hall wondering about the running back who gets the most carries behind ATN. It has been interesting as of late to watch the chatter for Roderick Robinson. There seems to be some belief that Robinson's kind of put himself in a good position just given his size and given everything else. And obviously, the the new addition to this discussion is the presence of a, you know, brand Josh Crawford as a brand new running backs coach at Georgia. But, you know, kind of prior to all of that, there had been a lot of positive chatter about Roderick Robinson. We'll see if that holds up. Um. TT says that I'm down low, hoping that somebody will send me a couple of those hairy dog bobbleheads. Listen, I'd be more than happy to get one of those. No doubt about that. I'm a big collector. We'd put it, listen, if I get one of those hairy dog bobbleheads, we'd put that on the shelf behind us here right now. On one of the shelves, anyway. We would do that. You better believe we'd do that. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Uh, DT says he got off Facebook about seven or eight years ago. It was a great decision for me. Yeah, listen, one thing we try to do on the show is we just sort of try to meet people where they are from the from the platform standpoint. Whichever platform works for people, we try to make that work for us. Um, let's see what else is going on here at dognation.com. 
Uh, Scott Harris says his favorite moment of last season was Missouri beating Ohio State and watching Coach Just for Men have to whine about that. That's very funny. Very funny. Uh, BMAC wondering about Nate Frazier. You know, I uh, I sort of – I believe that Nate Frazier could perhaps be more than this, but I do sort of like what Jeff has compared him to, a little bit like what DeAndre Swift was for Georgia in 2017 when he was – maybe the third leading rusher and an important player for Georgia. You know, Swift had the touchdown that put the SEC championship on ice uh, that year against Auburn. But, you know, maybe maybe not quite uh, ready yet to be kind of one of the two leading rushers because I think the overall perception here is that Trevor Etienne brings the kind of speed, the athleticism, that Georgia really wants that sort of thunder to go alongside that lightning. And that's why Nate Frazier is perhaps not – the best tandem to go with at the end of the moment. Maybe I turn out to, maybe that turns out to be wrong. But I think that's the perception here right now that Georgia wants the bruising back to match what at the end may be able to do athletically. And the sort of guy most positioned to be the successful bruising back right now might be Roderick Robinson, in part because Branson Robinson's coming back from injury. Barry Watkins says, I'm nervous about the portal in April, especially at running back. Yeah, I mean, look, I get the idea of that being a concern, but one of the things as a fan that would sort of alleviate my concern a little bit is the fact that you really can't prevent it. You know, Georgia's going to lose some players, and on a roster like Georgia's, it's sort of hard to lose players without it being someone you didn't think at some point in time could be you know, somewhat successful. And I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Of course, that could be at running back. Of course, that's the case. Um, I, I just think that's – just a reality that has to be confronted. Uh, Let us see what else. Kaylee says, I don't know if this is our Kaylee or different Kaylee, what's the largest animal you could take in a wrestling match? Um, I think that animals are probably better wrestlers than you give them credit for. One of the things I think the internet has done a disservice to humans with is we show animals animals being cute a lot and all of us grew up watching animal cartoons right so it's like animals are funny in cartoons they're cute in viral videos but animals are also wild and so i think the worst thing we do is is we show like the woman with her, like her pet orangutan how do you say it? orangutan is that how you say it uh or like you know even like the people who have like pythons as pets and things like that like Quirky pets, you know, kind of a personality trait. You know, people think they could hug pandas. You could not hug a panda. A panda would absolutely eviscerate you. Uh, uh, a panda would draw and quarter you just like that. And so I think it's important to note that, like, um, you know, if, like, let me give you an example. Here's an animal that, by appearances, based on a lifetime of watching cartoons as a kid and sort of cutesy videos as an adult, you see a raccoon, you would think, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that raccoon. But this is where, like, a movie like Elf, the, you know, the Will Ferrell vehicle, probably demonstrates the real truth. It's like, you know, Will Ferrell goes in for the hug on the, on the raccoon. The raccoon just attacks. That's an example of that. Like, you know, this idea that you're going to win a wrestling match against an animal, you're just not. You're just not. Unless it's, unless it's sedated, you're just not going to do that. Um, for sure. All right. Um, Scott Harris wants to do a Marlowe's event at the, uh, in Buford. Listen, I'd love to do that. Now, I don't know when that's coming, and I think it probably won't be in Buford, but I would love to do something like that very, very soon. I really would. I really would. Uh, let's go back over to YouTube. Let's see if we can shift through some of this madness for a second. Um, G. Gray says, 90% of y'all hated Stets and you're hypocrites. I've always liked the guy. Well, whether you did or you didn't, there are some Georgia fans that have a hard time, you know, kind of, and listen, we're benevolent, we're forgivers around here, but there are a lot of Georgia fans who really back themselves in a corner uh, as it relates to Stets and Bennett. And we warned you at the time that could be a mistake. Not because we knew how the future was going to play out, but because we knew if the future did play out a certain way, which was entirely possible, that people would have a hard time kind of going back on that. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I think that toxic is an overused word, but there was some sort of weird toxicity even after Georgia won a national championship. And some of that was just sort of related to some Georgia fans 
just having a hard – there were some Georgia fans that would have rather been right about Bennett than see Georgia win, and that was always a weird place to be. Um, uh, Georgia on tap says, animals don't follow Marcus of Queensbury rules. That's exactly right when it comes to, uh, when it comes to how they fight. That's indeed true. By the way, great YouTube video. Uh, it's the video of, um, I think it's Tracy Smothers wrestling a bear. And I remember when this happened. It was supposed to be Wendell Cooley, but somehow Cooley got replaced by Tracy Smothers. And uh, Gordon Soley is doing play-by-play of Tracy Smothers wrestling a bear. Very good, very good stuff. Very good stuff. Um, let's see what else. Freeman Durden says, from 1992 through 2006, Alabama was a bottom-feeding 6-6 six and six SEC team. But the current Bama fans have memory uh, have memory loss of that time. Freeman, I believe you're kind of right about that. Uh, I believe you're kind of right about that. Um, uh, by the way, I agree with Tomahawk Dog here, our buddy G. Grace. And this is what Tomahawk asked. He says, is go for three and 23 supposed to be a dig? He says, it's a lousy one if so. Who wouldn't want to be in a position to go for three and 23? Tom Hawk, you're so right. Now, listen, I like G. Grace. He knows that I do. Uh, I don't mind his presence here as a part of our show. He goes back years with us. So I'm probably a little kinder to him than some of you wish that I would be. But this whole idea that go for three and 23 is some sort of like, you know, uh, some sort of jab at Georgia. If the only thing you can say about Georgia is, ha, you came a couple of points shy of winning a third straight national championship then you are really standing on, you know, pretty shaky ground. If that's if, if that's all you've been reduced to in terms of your ongoing battle with Georgia is the fact that Georgia somehow came up just a little bit short of winning three straight national championships. I got to tell you, uh, you're in kind of a tough spot, a tough spot there when it comes to that. Wildman Slayer says, I trusted Kirby when it comes to Stetson. And look, we've said this before, you know, Kirby's probably earned your trust, but I don't know that anyone is necessarily deserving of your fealty. In other words, you know, you want to debate Kirby and his decision. That's what sports talk's all about. But I think there were some people, and this is where Wildman's comment, I think, has a lot of value. They genuinely convinced themselves that somehow Kirby wouldn't play the best quarterback or would make decisions on the basis other than what would give Georgia the best chance to win. It's like cliched and kind of like antiseptic as we're going to play the guy that gives us the best chance to win. The truth is, is of course that's what Georgia would do. Anything less than that's like being like some sort of like Manchurian candidate. I mean, of course you would play the player that gives you the best chance to win. A lot of Georgia fans had a hard time believing that could have been Stetson Bennett, but obviously, you know, history, I mean, history has a way of changing a lot over the course of a couple of years. And when it comes to the quarterbacks who were at Georgia at the time, you know, history has shifted a pretty good bit since then. Um, Frank Patterson, very, very funny here. Um, uh, Miriam Corbin, how about Miriam Corbin on the YouTube side today? What a, what a, what a thing that is. She says, B.A. loves us all. I do. I, listen, y'all know I love doing these comments, and I love the people who are regular part of our uh, commenting. You know that. Uh, and Miriam, of course, that's the case when it comes to you. Uh, let us see what else. Um, all right, we're going to go for right now. Appreciate you being here. Y'all check out R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They will show up on time to do the work. This promise, the price, this promise. You can trust them for all of that, including, listen, we turn the air conditioning on at my house because it's been pretty warm as of late. I'm also fat, so, you know, fat people like the A.C. But the point is, is that uh, it's it's been warm lately, so... It's time to get that air conditioning unit tuned up and ready to go for the spring and the summer if you are a little bit concerned about your ability to kind of make it through all of that. So find them online, rsandrews.com. They'll take good care of you on all of that, and they'll get your air conditioning unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs. There may be somebody has told you you need a new unit. Eventually you probably will, but R.S. Andrews may be able to tell you how you can get some new life out of that old unit, and it may only cost you 99 bucks to get it tuned up. So find them online, rsandrews.com, for more on that. Y'all have a great day. Back here tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Surpro. Fun to say that, and fun to see all of you back here again tomorrow.